Someone just pointed out to, well, I suggested to, because I address a lot of different ideas, I bring in so much. Um, I just can't help it, because all of Buddhism is so connected and everything is so relevant. So, but uh, Danny suggested very helpfully, he said, could you just sometimes at least give the name of that topic? Yes, you're so right. So I addressed previously impermanence, I addressed that. Things are changing constantly, and I address what's called dependent arising. So I gave you the three types of dependent ar arising, or the three types of dependence: dependence on causes and conditions, dependence on parts, on the on the parts and qualities and characteristics uh, something is dependent upon, and of course then, based on those parts, labeling it with a conceptual mind that is either having the thought it is such and such or actually using a symbol of language and calling it that uh, verbally but basically it's having the thought it is a flower based on certain parts right that's this dependent origination that's why we say things exist now as Holmes speaks about this um, the Dalai Lama talks about this um, he talks about, wait, let me just check which chapter that is. I get lost in the chapters. Chapter 4, which is part of part 2. Um, there's a lot of things he addresses. I mean, also a lot of things come up, so I can't talk about everything he speaks about, but definitely about causes and conditions that give rise to an object. Um, the parts that something belongs to, how it of course, connects to everything else around it. So it's, the Dalai Lama speaks about a holistic, a holistic, it's important that we develop a holistic view and don't simplify things. So with dependent arising, our mind simplifies things, sees the thing first of all as concrete and not just labeled, but just hidden being a flower, being an eye from its own side, 
But even though when we see causes and conditions, because of course it's difficult to deny those, we simplify it, we focus on one cause, see that as the cause of our problem, for instance, or we see just one part of a person and see the person as being defined by that part, by that quality, by the past mistake, etc. So we don't have a holistic view. So we all know that having a holistic view, I mean, even holistic medicine, everyone understands, and that's a good thing, to don't, not just to deal with the symptoms, but to affect, to, to look at the whole body as like a, a system that works together, that is dependent on each other. And our view is often not holistic. And why is this such a problem? Well, the, especially in relation to the eye, and I think we can all know this, we can all understand this. Oh, I, 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 I do have a question, I remember it now. Just a sec. So now with regard to the eye, just in everyday life, someone who's very obsessed with I, 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 of course there are different levels. Some people are more obsessed with themselves and others less. We know from our own experience. Of course, we don't necessarily know when we are the one more obsessed with the eye, but we can see it in other people. And have you, have you ever noticed when people are very much like I, 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 everything seems to be about them. Okay, it goes to a degree like, I think they're talking about me. I think, oh, these people are, you know, they're, they're looking at me. It seems to be everything is about the self. So it's very different, different, difficult for them to see the whole picture. They have a hard time listening to other people because it's about them. So they have a hard time to put themselves into the other person's shoe. So they don't necessarily enjoy listening to someone else. Before, before sooner or later, they like to bring it back to them. So first of all, these are oftentimes very paranoid people, unhappy people, scared people, worried people, because they're trying to protect something in a way that's totally unrealistic. <clears throat> and there's more fear, there's more worry, etc. There's less the ability to reach out to others. Because if you're only just concerned with your own problems, then thinking about the problems of other people is impossible. You're too worried about yourself. There's no space in your mind. And you don't perceive what other people go through, and you have a very skewed, a very distorted view of reality. Versus those who reach out to others, who are working for the benefit of others. You know, like when people are socially active, and they really feel for the other person, well, they put themselves into the shoe of another person, understand what they're going through in a limited fashion, and their own problems, they just disappear in that moment. Mm -hmm. That solidity of my own problems, well, because you've reached out. It's like you've gone from here, me, 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 to, wow. It's, kind of, it's like this natural, like moving away from here towards reaching out. You become more understanding, you understand the connections between things. So we can see that dependent arising and understanding that, gives you a much greater sense of what's going on. It allows you to look at other problems, understand them, have em empathy for others, you know, the wish possibly to do something, at least to listen, okay, and just be there. So, and just more of a sense of, I can breathe. More of a sense of liberation. So, can you see how this sense of reaching out, of understanding the whole picture, that's healthy. That gives rise to love, compassion. It's in accordance with reality. Versus, there's just me, just I. Okay. So the the stronger that sense, the more we are in contradiction to reality. The more we suffer. The less we are able to deal with the to to have love and compassion for others, to listen to others, to truly understand. Can you see that? Just that extreme example. Okay, I hope that gives you like a, a sense of that. Now, please, your question. Just to <coughs> to clarify. Yes. Because I think that uh, you used a lot of definitions, labeling names, um, and my clarification is about the perception aspect. 
mm -hmm. because uh, maybe uh, more uh, uh, deeply into the uh, reality perception. Yes, yes. Because you can say that reality stays the same, but our perception shapes or reshapes. Uh huh. And, and maybe it relates to what you mentioned about the physics, the quantum physics. Yes. That, uh, sometimes we can shape reality just by viewing it or participating. Exactly. In it. Exactly. Uh, so, so maybe these definitions of, of essence, because when you speak about flower, you speak about the essence of life. Yes. It's not the parts of it, but the essence of it. Yes. Exactly yes. like this, I, I don't, don't uh, forgot the name of this man that was uh, responsible of the, the ethics in the, in the, in the uh, convent. Uh, it's a, the disciplinary. Yeah, oh, the disciplinary. Oh, the disciplinary. Exactly. Okay. So there is this a certain kind of essence that comes with the title okay, okay. Okay. and good, when good. it disappears yes, yes. the man stays the same just the title disappears the, 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 the table is the same you know? okay. Okay. it's just the essence that can move from place to place okay. reality, reality, reality and it's our uh, perception that shapes okay, right. okay. You, you express that very beautifully how my expressionation was so confusing. <laughs> I mean, I understand that some people, if you have like more of a background, it may make may, more sense, but you're right. I've addressed so many different aspects and definitely from what you said, yes, this sounds very confusing. It is confusing and I added to the confusion. So let me say this much. Um, reality, when we talk about reality, Actually, there is something called reality in Buddhism. But what it actually is, is the absence of a solid kind of existence. An existence independent of our own mind, which would be what you said about physics, for instance. Phenomena don't exist in and of themselves having an independent essence which we just happen to perceive. No, they're the opposite. Phenomena have no self-essence and they are, whatever they are we say about them, only because of our mind labeling. Now, me saying that, I can almost hear your mind go, well, then there's nothing there seems like it but never mind stay with me on that so basically the way we usually go about doing this meditation doing this analysis we actually start to look for something in the first place but the Dalai Lama mentioned this further along the line he doesn't start with negation so much he more focuses on saying how things exist, how they're interconnected, etc. So I've also left it more for tomorrow to do the specific meditation where you just look for like the eye, you analyze as in like reach the point of not being able to find it. <coughs> but as I said, you can do that, but it's a, it's, it's a very effective way of doing it, but without putting it into a concept, into a, into a context of how it's beneficial, etc. It doesn't really work without the context of dependent arising. You may fall into extreme of nihilism. So that's why I explained all that. But to go back to your question, actually, we have a wrong sense that there is this self-existence, that whatever exists holds some essence and then based on that essence, I may call it this or that, uh, I can do things with it. Now that essence doesn't exist. Whatever exists, exists only because on a certain basis, we label it as such. So labeling is very important, but labeling doesn't happen randomly. You need a mind that labels and you need a basis on which you label. However, even that mind, now, now it becomes difficult, even that mind is merely labeled. 
and the basis on which you label it is also merely labeled. Okay? This so is, This is the Buddhist approach? So there is no essence to things? There's there no is essence the human essence or the essence of religion or an essence of, of a thought? There's a conventional essence. There's a conventional essence. This is the hardest. This is the hardest to understand in Buddhism. Really, I mean, everything else in relation to, in relative to that, is easily under, easier, relatively easy understood, easily understood. So, what I'm trying to say is, for instance, people sometimes ask, and I don't know whether this is helpful, but they ask, is there good or bad in Buddhism? Of course there is good and bad. But the difference is there is a conventional good and bad. There is no inherent good and bad. Now, with the inherent, essence is a little bit tricky. The word essence is sometimes used. Now, what is the difficulty is we use words in everyday language, like everyday language, and we now try to explain an idea that is actually beyond words. Okay, but for now, all we have is words, and we can have a gross understanding of what Buddhism is about, dependent on words. Now, what does Buddhism deny? There are few words that are used to describe the same thing. There is no independent existent, existence. So, no independent flower. Going back to the flower. No independent good, no independent bad. That's kind of easy. Oh yeah, independent, big deal. Okay, sometimes when you just want to talk about Buddhism in a few words, you say the actual reality of phenomena is that phenomena don't exist independently. Most people go, yeah, I know that. Okay. But what you know is just your intellectual mind knows that deep within, that's not how it feels. Why? Because it feels as if there's something in the object that doesn't depend on anything. It is naturally there. So even that thing is denied in Buddhism. You may call that objective existence, objective as in like independent of mind. You may call it independent existent or inherent existent or existent by way of its own characteristic doesn't mean we understand clear what is meant here. Now I take an example that is like, I've used it so often I'm almost bored of myself using it, but I'll use it. What does it mean inherent or natural? Let me give you an example, an everyday example. Is fire, no, let's take water, water works better. Is water naturally cold or hot? Neither, right? It's neither cold or hot. It depends on external circumstances, such as a source of fire to heat it up, or maybe a cold environment to cool it down. So fire is not naturally or inherently cold or hot. Would you agree? Water, water, water. Water is not inherently, oh, you're paying attention, great. Water is not <laughs> inherently cold or hot, naturally cold or hot. But if I ask you, is water naturally wet? No. Yes. Is fire naturally hot? No. Yes. Okay. yes. Some yes. It's naturally? Of course. Of course. It's naturally. It's naturally hot. Why do you say it's not naturally hot? About water? About, about fire. About fire. About fire. fire I'm, I'm wondering, but about water, it can be ice also. Can be but water, ice is not water, and water is not ice. You see? There is no water. When you say, when it's ice, you no longer call it water. I'm talking about good old water, <laughs> not ice. Okay? Water can be hot. Like a child can become an adult, but it's no longer a child at that time. So what I call water, 
Water is water, not ice, wet or not. I no longer call it water, right? So is water naturally wet? Is it naturally wet? No. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. 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 Right? Well, not for a fish. It's all in relation to something. Yes. Uh, not in relation. It's all in relation to exactly. something. Ah, it's, it's wetting something. Walking, it's dependent. Okay, let's go back to the idea that water is not naturally warm <laughs> because you need something other than water to make it warm. So that's not natural to water. And exactly from a Buddhist point of view, although in everyday language we say water is naturally wet, it's okay to use that language. But if we really check, Water is only wet in relation to something or in dependence on something other than itself. Number one, two hydrogen, one oxygen. Number two, someone experiencing it as wet. Or fire for that matter. Fire, we say it's naturally uh, hot. But what is heat? If I'm close to a fire, and my, and my body, let's say they're living beings, that when they're close to fire, there's actually an the experience of cold. We as humans, when we experience fire, there's the experience of heat. We get burnt. But there may be material that doesn't get burnt, close to, but there is material that doesn't get burnt, that doesn't get affected by fire, certain temperatures anyway, and they don't experience heat, those living beings. Let's say they are there, I don't know. So, in relation to us humans, fire is hot. And in relation to us humans, so it's in relation to an um, experience that we can say fire is hot and water is wet. Okay? It's also in relation to certain molecules that are not water, that are only part of water. So it's the same logic. It's in and of itself. There's nothing... There's, n there's no intrinsic wetness in water that doesn't depend on anything to be wet. It is, we say it is wet, we say water is wet in relation to the experience we have. Now let me take it to a person. If I think of a person, any person, it seems to me there's something within that being that makes this a person. And if I ask you, say anything about this person that you say about that person, which is part of your sense, there's something coming from the side of the person making that a person. Anything you say about that person is not inherent in that person. Anything. Why? When you say this is, say it's a mother. This person is a mother, not because there's some motherness found there. No, there's mind and body. But in relation to the fact this person has either adopted a child or given birth to a child, in relation to that, I call this person a mother. In relation to the fact that this person is married to a man, I call this person a wife. In relation to a particular body and a mind feeling like a woman, those two together, or maybe whichever we choose, label on that, I say it's a woman. Okay? In relation to a passport and parents, whatever, you, you, you call it Israeli. You call her Israeli. In relation to certain mental qualities, I call her kind. In relation to a body figure, I call her tall. So it's always in the relation to something other than herself that I call her this, that, and the other. There is nothing coming from the person's side. So as one great Lama, who's very close to his home, there's a young Lama who uh, started teaching now, young Dinobuchi said, if this person existed inherently as a person, you could say something about this person without referring to anything but the person. Saying, saying it's just person and we would all understand. But the problem is we can't because person is just a label 
given based on something other than person. If person existed inherently, when we said person, we would all understand what we're talking about. But that is just a label given based on a body and a mind. But then when you look at the body itself, that is just the label we give to parts that are not a body. And then when you take those parts, the belly, the chest, the arms, those are also just objects labeled on the basis of something that is not an arm. Based on something other than itself, I call it an arm. Okay? So if you look for the arm, amongst the arm, you don't find any arm. It's just the label we apply, right? We apply this thing arm, we say it's an arm based on something other than itself. And the, the scary thing initially is you can go on and on and on and look for something and you never find anything. You can go onto a molecular atomic level, look for the, like within the atoms, where the atoms, what is the atom? The nucleus, the neutron, the proton, right? The quarks. None of those is the atom. We label the atom on the basis of that. And then we go further and further. There's never an essence of something that is not just labeled based on something other than itself. Now, that absence of finding something, finding something that exists independently of us calling it that, or someone calling it that, that absence is the nature of all phenomena. That is the reality of all phenomena. It's just a negation of something that we wrongly think is there. We wrongly think there is this, there must be something. We're so used to it. We're so used to adding things. Okay? Don't ask me where it comes from. It's just there. Who cares where it comes from? From a Buddhist point of view, we don't ask for a beginning. It's a bit like when you get shot by an arrow and you're like, where does that come the arrow from? Who made the arrow? Who made it? What produced it? No, you pull it out. <laughs> right? You don't care so much where it comes from. You care about how can I remove it because it is the reason for why we have problems. That's where all the problem starts. Does that answer your question? No. <laughs> Why not? It's more confusing. Yeah, I, I don't want to turn it to. Okay, yes, yes, yes. To, okay. Fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. It's, it's a very, very interesting uh, concept that, that needs to. Very good. It's an interesting concept. Mm -hmm. Initially, it just kind of sounds nice. That's good, that's very good. Initially, it kind of makes sense, <coughs> but it does not accord with my sense of reality. Right. Why? Why not? Why not? Because I perceive everything as inherently existent. This absence of an essence does seem also to exist inherently. Everything, so it's, it, it stands in total contradiction. Now, the first step is only understanding the concept. Does it make sense or not? That's where you start. What else can you start with? That's, that's the beginning of it. And the good thing about anything you hear is everything gets easier the more you hear about it, the more you familiarize with it. So if it makes sense to you the first time and then you take it deeper and deeper, every time it makes more sense. You go a little deeper, you go a little deeper until eventually you can apply it to a problem and suddenly things that used to be so big and so insurmountable, suddenly you can breathe through it. And that's when you think, oh, I want to hear more about it. <laughs> okay? But initially, yes, it's just a nice concept. Great. Very good. Two more, and then we meditate. Yes. I think I understand part of what you said. If yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, still, mm -hmm. there's a basis of reputation. Basis of imputation. Imputation. And, imputation, and you won't uh, impute uh, person on table. No, you won't impute person on table. Okay, mm -hmm. so how come? Good, good, good question. Why? This is very important because it's easily misunderstood. If everything is labeled, everything is possible. Anything is possible. 
No, 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 no. Even labeling depends on something other than itself. Mm -hmm. There is consistency in the sense that 